Hello and welcome to my talk about visions for the Linux kernel PWM subsystem. Actually, I intended to hold this talk in person on the Open Source Summit, but due to the extreme weather conditions in and around Vienna, I wasn't able to attend. So there is only this talk recording. I hope you enjoy it anyhow. I'm Uwe Kleinekönig. I work as a uh, software engineer at Play Libre and I'm also the PWM subsystem maintainer in the kernel and contribute to various other parts of the kernel too. If you want to reach me, you find my email address in the kernel maintainers file or somewhere on the net for sure. There's the PWM mailing list. There's also a Linux PWM IRC channel on Libera. Feel free to join there and uh, start uh, chatting if you have questions or concerns or feedback. Uh, everything is welcome. It's very low volume to give it a, a nice wording. So it's very likely that I will see you uh, showing up there if you have something to say. My employer, Belibre, is a, a software consultancy based in the French Riviera. We are um, approximately 60 engineers. A big part is located in Nice, uh, but um, we're spread around the world. We're working on everything embedded. A big part of that is the typical open source projects that uh, you know, Linux, U-Boot, Zephyr, also tool chains and uh, what is uh, around and above these. The motivation for this talk is to present my ideas for improvement of the subsystem. There are already some of the ideas um, in the prototype stage. Um, there are currently patches uh, in discussion on the PWM mailing list. And what I really want to reach with this talk is to, to learn about you. That is, who uses PWMs and for what? What are your challenges, your pain points? Why are you using the PWM subsystem or maybe uh, even don't use it because it doesn't fulfill your needs? Um, please uh, get in touch, tell me about your, uh, your expectations and uh, what you would need and uh, what you use. Uh, only this way I can uh, take these into account for my future work. To dive into um, the technical topic, uh, first a quick overview. What is a PWM? It's a hardware unit that emits um, a simple periodic square wave signal. It's used to control LEDs or the backlight of your mobile phone. It is also used to uh, control motors in the simple case of just a fan. In the more uh, complicated fan, in the more complicated case, uh, it can control a vehicle of some sort. They are also used to um, construct the signal emitted by remote controls. A PWM output waveform is um, abstracted by period and duty cycle measured in nanoseconds. Um, during a single period, um, the duty cycle defines the first phase where the signal is typically high and during the remainder of the period, the signal is low then. And once this period is done, it just repeats uh, with these parameters until a reconfiguration happens. There is the polarity that you can use to uh, invert the signal. I'll come to that uh, on a later slide. And you can enable and disable the hardware unit. Obviously, if it's enabled, it emits this uh, waveform. And if it's not, 
it might or might not uh, give an output. Uh, that depends on the underlying hardware. Currently, uh, the PWM subsystem uses these uh, mentioned parameters, period, duty cycle, and polarity to define a waveform. And there is a SysFS user space API that you can use to control a PWM hardware chip if your application logic isn't in a kernel driver but in a user space application. I think, but I don't know, so um, I rely on your feedback uh, to that talk that most um, applications that have higher demands than simple control of an LED use this uh, SysFS user space API, but actually I don't know. So please tell me. Here's the promised slide about polarity. Normally, as I said, um, the duty cycle at the start of each period defines the phase where the signal is high and the remainder of the period the signal is low. With an inverse polarity waveform, it's the other way around. So the first phase of the period defined by the duty cycle, the signal is low and the remainder, the signal is high. Both have in common that at the start of the period you have an edge of the signal. This is a somewhat a convenient future, uh, feature for some consumers because um, it doesn't make the subsystem more expressive to be able to use inverse polarity because if I remove the legend and the period start markers uh, you get a waveform and you can properly pro you can properly uh, implement it using um, a normal polarity waveform um, still it's useful at times um, yeah the um, uh, the sysfs user space api is um, as simple as you would expect you first um, uh, export a given uh, PWM channel uh, that is to uh, give the SysFS API exclusive control about the hardware and then you can configure period duty cycle polarity each in its dedicated uh, SysFS file and you can, uh, once you've configured the other parameters, you can enable the chip and then expect that it emits the configured waveform or something very similar at least. There are some challenges or things to improve. One is uh, configuration changes are not atomic. That means if you have a, your PWM running and you want to change to a new waveform and it differs in both duty cycle and period, you have two files to write. And that's, this means that once you've written the first but not yet the second, your chip is configured with a, an intermediate state that you don't actually want to emit. And depending on your use case, this is grave or it doesn't matter much. Um, one uh, culprit in this is that these immediate states must be valid. One of the simpler uh, problems is that the period must always at least be as big as the duty cycle. There are some uh, hardware specific uh, further problems. Um, for example, it can happen that if you increase the period, the configured uh, duty cycle becomes invalid. And this means that you must increase the period slower and then you can um, increase your uh, duty cycle and so you have to add more intermediate steps depending on your hardware. Most of the time this doesn't happen, but if it does, it is a pain. The next uh, problem is there is no way to determine the current configuration. You can read out the SysFS files but these only give you what was configured last. Usually, however, the 
low-level driver has to deviate a bit from the requested value of period and duty cycle because uh, the description of the, the, the generic description of the waveform has a nanosecond resolution and there's no hardware known to me that can implement each nanosecond uh, setting even when limited on a, a certain interval. So um, there has to be some uh, rounding when a given request is implemented. And as I said, you can only get the last configuration, but not what is currently configured. And to still increase this wish, you can um, even, uh, you, you cannot determine what would the hardware emit given a certain uh, request, so without touching the hardware. Now a, a quick presentation how the low-level drivers uh, look or the functions they have to implement. There's this generic uh, description of a waveform consisting of period, duty cycle and polarity and an uh, enable property. And there are just two callbacks. One is write this uh, state into the hardware and the other is the reverse. Read the hardware state and put it into this uh, generic uh, well, software model. Now to, uh, to the main part of this talk, the ideas uh, for improvement. Um, I have five ideas, maybe you have more. Um, I'll go to, to these five uh, in detail in the following. The first is coupling of channels. Sometimes you need to have two or more outputs work uh, hand in hand together to, uh, to give you uh, what you actually want. For example, this waveform is needed for motors that work like uh, a bike. While the, uh, dur or during the first half of the common period, you push uh, with your left leg into the pedal of your, your bike, and during the second half, you push with the right leg. And repeating that left, right, left, right, uh, you can actually drive your bike. Currently, this is um, domain specific knowledge, so you have to know uh, that the chip you're using. Um, actually syncs the periods if you configure both channels for the same period. So it might happen if you uh, just uh, use an unknown chip that your periods are not synced, which results in times where you don't push any pedal at all and maybe worse times where you uh, push both pedals at the same time. So uh, this is um, yeah, something where we could improve. The next is uh, duty offset. This is a generalization of uh, the polarity. Instead of just being able to say normal or inverse, um, the duty offset is given, that is the offset between the period start and the rising edge of the waveform. This taken alone, similar to polarity, doesn't uh, give any more expressiveness um, of the PWM subsystem. Because if again I remove the period start markers and the legend, you cannot see where the period starts and you can easily model it using an, a normal duty offset zero waveform to get exactly that output. It might only be visible uh, when the configuration is changed and you see how one waveform changes into the other and then you might be able to, to pinpoint where the period starts. But for usual applications it doesn't really matter. However, if you combine it with channel coupling, you get something that is useful and more expressive. In this case here, you just have, compared to the bike example, a smaller 
uh, high phases of the signals. This could be useful for the bike motor if you want to make sure that you only start pressing with your right leg once the pedals are over the dead point uh, where the pedals are uh, vertically aligned and where pushing uh, just uh, doesn't give you anything. So you wait a bit until the pedals are rotated a bit further and then you can push with your right leg when you're sure that uh, the right leg is a bit uh, over the, um, the middle of uh, the axis. It is also used, and this is, uh, was the motivation to implement that, for high-speed readout of an ADC. A colleague of mine just implemented uh, this in a driver. Uh, the first PWM is used to trigger a, um, a conversion of the ADC. That is, uh, it starts a measurement of the signal that is uh, connected to the ADC. It takes some time and once this is done, the other PWM is used to trigger the SPI bus controller to read out the conversion result. The result is then fed to a DMA channel and so the CPU can sleep during all these uh, conversions and reading out and just uh, read the results in bulk from uh, the DMA channel and uh, this allows to give several mega samples per second um, in, in this setting. The next uh, wishlist item is exactness. This is uh, just to clean up with an inconsistency about um, uh, among the different low-level drivers because uh, there are different algorithms that are implemented to pick a possible period if a certain period is uh, requested. Some pick the period that is nearest to the requested values and some round it down. So this is again something that you can cope for if you have uh, a known chip that you work with. However, if you don't have that, you might be surprised by uh, what you get for a given request. And the next one is about uh, knowing beforehand what happens. So if I uh, configure a given period and duty cycle and polarity combination that I can query what I would get and know beforehand uh, what, what I get. So if I want a waveform with, for example, a period of 1000 nanoseconds and I would get, say, 960 nanoseconds, I could test if I, for a bigger request, could get to, say, 1,020 nanoseconds, which might be beneficial or better than the 960 because it's nearer to 1,000 nanoseconds. The next uh, and last wishlist item is picosecond support. I found that implemented in a kernel vendor tree However, I'm convinced that uh, the answer to the question, is it needed, is to be answered by no, because all PWM chips known to me don't have a resolution uh, that would justify that. That is, um, if I just minimally reconfigure the output, say I modify the period, the changed period differs by more than one nanosecond from the original waveform. So I don't gain anything if I can specify the period in picoseconds, if uh, chunks of thousand picoseconds give me the same configuration anyhow. So there isn't much to win. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. In the last few weeks, I uh, spent uh, much time to implement uh, some improvements to the PWM subsystem. The patches are in their fifth revisions on the PWM mailing list. You can uh, look there and give feedback in that context if you want to. It addresses some of the wishes I uh, 
I presented on, that you could have. For one, it is atomic, so you don't have to care about the uh, valid intermediate steps. And so it's on par to what is implemented in the kernel API since 2016. It's uh, supporting this new uh, waveform API obviously needs um, changing uh, the um, low level drivers because the abstraction of a waveform changed. And I took that opportunity to uh, well, make the promise that you, you get a certain rounding behavior and you also can query the resulting a waveform of a given request. If I have to touch the low-level drivers uh, anyhow, I, uh, doing everything in one go um, is, is a nice thing, so I picked that up too. I didn't address channel coupling, which is uh, by part um, because I didn't uh, was I, I wasn't able to come up with a nice abstraction for that. So you still can use channel coupling, but as before, you have to know that your chip supports it. So, um, yeah, um, that's, uh, that keeps to be as it was. The new abstraction uses duty offset, which gives the needed um, flexibility for this ADC case and for the reasons I mentioned um, it doesn't use picosecond resolution I'm staying with nanoseconds. The character uh, device has one uh, device per PWM chip that means um, it's an abstraction of a chip that possibly um, gives you more than one PWM output so the input parameter includes this uh, HW PWM parameter, which tell which indicates uh, which of the provided outputs is to be used, and then the three parameters that are needed for the duty offset representation of a waveform. Compared to the old representation, there is no property for disabled PWM. You can still get the effect of disabling the PWM uh, by using a period length of zero, um, which otherwise doesn't have any semantic because it doesn't say anything about the state in the future if you only say uh, what you want during a period of length zero. There are four um, callbacks implemented. One is the answer to uh, what would my hardware implement if I feed it a certain request. The second gateway form is what is currently implemented by the hardware. And then there's a pair of functions to configure your hardware. One is the rounded case, which is the simpler one, where it just say I want a state that is approximately like this. Um, just feed it into the hardware subject to the usual rounding rules. And the other is the exact variant of it, where I say I want exactly this waveform, and if you cannot implement it and have to deviate by one nanosecond or more, uh, don't reconfigure the hardware return with an error. Compared to the current state where you have just two callbacks, we now need four, which is um, a need because there's also more flexibility in the new API. There is a pair of functions that converts between the generic uh, representation of the waveform in nanosecond resolution and uh, opaque hardware specific uh, representation um, of that setting and a pair of functions that reads or writes 
this OPEC hardware specific uh, description to or from the hardware. If I um, uh, put these together, I can form all four variants that are um, available as uh, kernel functions or also on the uh, character device. I can combine these to, uh, to implement the four functions. To round a given waveform, I just convert the generic uh, waveform description to the hardware specific one and convert it back. To get the current uh, waveform implement, I read it out into the hardware specific uh, representation and convert that to the generic one. And to set the waveform, the rounded variant is just converted to the hardware specific uh, representation and write it out. And if I want the exact variant, I have to inspect the conversion result of the 2HV uh, configuration and check if it really matches the original request. And if it does, I write it out, and if not, I return an error. Yeah, this is what I wanted to, to tell you, to present you, and uh, I remind you again uh, about the questions I have to you. Does it improve things for you? Um, does it help you? Uh, would you use it? Um, please contact me and tell me if it helps you. Thanks for your attention. Have a nice time. Bye. Hello. <laughs> the light is not a friend. Up to now, I don't hear anything. Oh, I... But Kevin will translate. Yeah. Well, he, and Uwe will repeat the question too. So I'm. So you're probably going to hear me. Ah, I can hear you. Yeah. Let's just un unmute on yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just unmute while ask while asking the question. So the question, Uwe, is why is the new Chardev interface needed compared to the uh, SysFS interface? Okay, so. Um, the SysFS interface has the drawback, well, one, that you can only update one parameter at a time. So if you want to change a uh, period and duty cycle in one go, this isn't possible uh, using SysFS. And another uh, that is maybe uh, also very relevant in practice is that uh, SysFS is slow. It's, um, <laughs> You need to take several mutexes if you write to a uh, SysFS file, and uh, there's a considerable speed up uh, when using the character device. On my STM32 uh, dev board I use for prototyping, the speed up is approximately 400%, so I could uh, manage uh, four times uh, more um, uh, reconfigurations in the same time than compared with uh, the SOSFS API.
So will the, will the uh, character device support coupled PWMs also? Um, okay, the question uh, about coupling of the, character, of the channels using the character device, uh, currently it does not, but um, the eventual plan is to uh, handle that. Um, there are some more uh, uh, numbers free for additional commands. Um, it should be possible, maybe similar to how GPIO handles um, bulk uh, setting, to just uh, send several um, uh, of these uh, waveform structs in a single I.O. control, and then this could be handled. But uh, up to now, this isn't the focus. And uh, for the start, what I intend to put into next after the just opened merge window uh, closes is uh, to not care for that as uh, presented in uh, the talk earlier. So once you add that, you'll need support for an aggregator similar to a GPIO aggregator? Um, a GPIO aggregator, I'm not sure uh, what this would exactly mean, but um, uh, there would be some sort of interface to, to set several um, PWMs in one go. Yes, this is the idea. How it looks exactly, I don't know yet mostly because I uh, didn't care for it yet. I delight that uh, to the future. Um, but if there are some ideas and um, if this uh, is uh, important, not only for me, um, uh, there will be some progress in that direction, yeah. Is the new sub, sub, sub system already part of 611? Um, no, um, the, the new subsystem isn't part of uh, 611 yet. Um, it will probably go into uh, 613 only because um, the merge window for 612 just opened and um, it wasn't uh, in next up to now, and this is something that I want to have in next for some time first before getting it uh, into the main line to, to be sure that uh, no uh, uh, bad regressions will happen. So there's some patience to be applied yet. Mark, did you have a question? So, so there's a question on how to do arbitrary waveforms, wave for example, like two pulses and followed by nothing. Um, okay, about uh, two or more pulses in a single period. Um, this came up um, from time to time in the past already, but I'm not convinced uh, this is something uh, we should handle. Um, my impression so far is that uh, this is very specific to, uh, to single chips that can do that. But, um, well, in, in my bubble, um, this isn't something that uh, has a real practical need or a relevance for, for more than a single developer. So um, I tend to, to not uh, walk in that direction. Um, but uh, if you have the, the feeling that this is needed and sensible, um, don't let me stop you to discuss that. And Tim, did you have a question? Okay. Anybody else? So there's a question on if you have some sort of time, time frame or schedule for the coupling support uh, feature. Okay, um, about the uh, uh, a time frame for the coupling, and no, there um, isn't uh, a time frame yet. Um, 
actually this uh, also the um, uh, the things I did now for the duty offset and uh, the charity uh, device API, this was driven by uh, commercial needs. So we had a customer that uh, needed that. And uh, my, uh, my, time, uh, my, my time out of business, my, my hobby time for PWM is limited. I, I do some maintenance stuff for the subsystem in my free time. But um, probably I won't be able to to do such a big development um, in my free time in uh, in a reasonable reasonable time frame. So it depends a bit on on the commercial needs, or if someone pops up and uh, spends some time and uh, provides patches on the mailing list. So there's a couple questions on the couple is on the will the coupling be able to support more than just two channels and then if so can you have like one channel be proportional to another channel type of feature um okay um having more than one channel and um using different periods while well, one being a multiple of the others um is the topic of the question um well, it will be uh, uh, possible for sure to couple more than two channels. Um, this is just something that uh, the API that I uh, have in mind so far uh, would not limit that. I'm not sure if there is an application. Um, and I think it, I would limit it to have the same period for all uh, couple channel, uh, channels. Um, not sure if uh, there is this, if uh, doing this more loose and uh, having one uh, the multiple of the other um, would add complications. For for, for example, uh, regarding to roundings. So if if one channel is 11 uh, nanoseconds uh, configured for 11 nanoseconds period, and the other a third of that, you you have rounding issues. Um, this seems complicated to me, um, but maybe there's a solution and um, I'm willing to think about it. Yeah, Tim. So does this only apply to uh, PWM hardware or does this also apply to software versus hardware? So will this only apply to PWM hardware devices or can it also apply to the just bit bang uh, software driven PWMs? Um, Okay, regarding software PVMs, uh, PWMs and um, uh, coupling, um, there will be no limitations. There is a, um, uh, a driver that uh, does GPIO bit banging, uh, creating a PWM waveform, and uh, the API will not uh, distinct between uh, which driver uh, there is in use. Um, well, the bit banging driver is a bit of a best effort thing because um, it depends on the CPU and uh, waking it up repeatedly. And um, I'm not sure that you have um, reliable timing, but uh, nothing will stop you to use it. And if it works for you, uh, that's great. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, go ahead. So there's a comment that um, someone's seen uh, a user space library in the Git repo. Is there a, is there a plan for a release of the user space library? Um, uh, yes, there, there was an, a user space library scene. Um, I think I mentioned it uh, once in the talk. Um, I intend to, to make a release uh, once the uh, required bits are in the kernel. Um, that I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, what the uh, kernel API is. And then uh, I intend to, to maintain that one too and keep it in sync and expand it uh, as the kernel uh, API grows. So uh, yes, you can rely on that uh, 
once the necessary bits are in the kernel. Okay, so that's all we have time for. Thanks, Uwe, for joining, and thanks, everybody, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for listening and your interest. And uh, as I said in the talk, uh, feel free to, to come to me and uh, tell me about your needs and ideas and uh, pain points. Thanks.